today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures. Make every analyst a hunter. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never-before-seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame. Automate the hunt. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. This is uh, what we're calling a technical segment. I think it's going to be more of a, a discussion uh, and topic-based segment, segment, but it is going to get pretty technical uh, in the container space. And I am so excited to have with me uh, a couple of folks that know way more about this <laughs> than I do. Uh, I'm still learning. I ask both of these uh, individuals questions all the time. Uh, they're experts in this field for sure, and I'm excited that they're able to share uh, their knowledge with our audience. As we found, I think, in security, our knowledge of how applications are being deployed and built today uh, in the container world is we've got a lot of work to do to catch up uh, in my mind. And I think many of us in the security community uh, admit to that. Uh, I just happen to be in a unique position where I could deploy an app and, and learn some stuff. And I feel like I built up a semi-foundation. Uh, but here with me, of course, is Matt Alderman. Uh, from Layered Insight. Thank you. And what's your title at, at Layered Insight? Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer. There you go. That's a mouthful. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, also, John Kinsella is with us. He is the co-founder and head of product for Layered Insight. Um, he's got a very diverse working background that includes security and network consulting, software development, data center operations. John is one of the few people that I've spoken with that uh, has real knowledge and practical knowledge about how containers are deployed in an enterprise fashion. So, John, it's very nice to have you on the show today. I'm happy to be here. So, I want to I, I get started and talk about, uh, John, you, we were just talking before the segment, uh, and you were mentioning kind of the progression, which is interesting because it's where I started, right? I'm like, oh, I want to learn this Docker thing. Like, Matt mentioned it to me years ago when we worked together at Tenable, and I'm like, wait, Hold on, back up. What's a container? <laughs> and then I started playing around with some containers on my computer. And I was like, well, that's kind of cute and interesting. I'm like, well, what if I were to take a, an application and actually put it in this container space? And wow, the challenges and issues you run in using the community edition of, of Docker is where I went to uh, experiment. And then I started looking at well, what our enterprise is doing. Uh, and I think that progression is really where we kind of want to start, John. So what are some of the... Um, Things to consider if you're going to make that journey, and what are some of the pain points you're going to experience along the way? Yeah. So, you know, the way I think about it is what Docker's done a really amazing job at is is, is not so much the container itself, but, you know, really the, the key what they brought to the industry is how do you make that as easy as possible for someone to package up whatever they've got and then use the, if I can use the phrase, throw it over the fence to the next guy, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, um, that's really what this came down to. It, it's they made it super simple to use on a laptop. You know, on, on my Mac, I can make a few clicks and like you've got Docker installed. Cool. Okay, now what do you do with this? If you think about that compared to um, VirtualBox or VMware or Parallels or any of these other tools for um, you know pick an operating system. So they start yeah, off with a really great John, way to do I, that. I just want to stop you there because I noticed that too when I was playing around with uh, web apps again. So we we did this project a, yeah, a while ago, right? And I was ago. like. I need some vulnerable web apps. I want to test out this newly minted uh, open source scanner. And with one command, to speak to how easy it is, I had a vulnerable web app running. I'm like, where was this like two or three two years, years ago when, when we were testing, testing it? I'm like, it's yeah. literally one, once you have Docker installed, it's one yeah. command and the app is running. I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. Versus it's a it's virtual amazing how much trouble and, some people uh, go to to create a vulnerable web application and put that out in production. But yeah, nowadays it's right? really easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's... Uh, and, and that's what it makes it so super attractive to people. And it, it you get you know the developers look at it like anytime you can make a developer's life easier, mm -hmm. any any of us security people you know this right. If we can make it easier for them to see a scan or see the results or or fix something, that that's ease. You know we're all lazy people, um, and and that's what sort of got Docker really. Um, Got that traction in containers. I, I tend to use Docker and containers interactively, but they're you know a little bit one's a brand, one's not. Um, 
so you take that and then like, okay, how do you how do you get that running outside of your laptop, right? So one of the things which Docker was supposed to solve, and this is sort of the interesting thing, it was supposed to make it really easy, as I just said, to package stuff up and, and run it wherever you want. But I just said at the same time, it's really not easy to do that. So very, very, um, the, the, the goalpost sort of moved, but it, the problem is still there. So now the problem went from like, how do you... Um, able to take that application and, and run it consistently with the same versions and the same frameworks and everything installed, you have just sort of move that problem down in a way. So suddenly now it's like, okay, well, how do you run 10 of those? How do you get the storage right? How do you make sure it's secure? Um, and, and that's sort of the first sort of humps and, and bumps that people have to jump through to get to that, right? So people start thinking about Docker Swarm moving over to like you know Amazon or, or Microsoft Azure or, or maybe their own data center and 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 then Docker did a really great job of uh, making a swarm cluster easy to set up and get running right uh, you know it's not clicks but a few types and, and suddenly you've got nodes that are able to talk to each other or servers that are able to talk to each other in a, a secure manner and a secure key exchange and then okay now you've got your next learning curve of how do I actually get my container running on that and communicating with each other across it and service discovery and how do I find where my database is and so you go through your next sort of set of humps there um, and and we've gone through this at Laird inside over the last two years right so we started with docker and then docker swarm and then docker swarm mode and you know we've looked at uh, OpenShift and Mesos and now we're on to Kubernetes and at each sort of hop along that way as you get bigger and the number of containers you have running uh, really grows and then you start scaling out to handle bigger loads, you just have to go back and go, how, okay, how do I do this again, right? You know, WordPress is a good example. You can get a WordPress container. Um, and, you know, people are familiar with that. You know, you got a, a WordPress and runs on PHP and then some sort of a, a database. Okay, that sounds cool. Well, you know, we can set up a database in, in Docker, that's simple. Um, you delete the, the or the database stops or you delete it for some reason. The first lesson you learn is, oh, I need my data volume that the database uses has to be on a, a separate volume. So when I delete mm -hmm. my container, I don't just delete my data. Um, so you figure out that sort of bump in the night. Yeah, it's, next, it's very, uh, what I found in, in just that aspect, John, was that like in, in school when I was learning the program, they're like, keep your logic separate from the data, right? I'm like, all yeah. right, well, that's cool. But then when you get into containers, it's, your your data is not even just separate from your application, but it's also like separated from your operations and infrastructure. Like your data is yeah. a separate volume, and not only your application, but its infrastructure it needs to run is also separate from the data, which I think is a different way of thinking about like how you configure and secure your application versus the networking and the connections versus your storage was totally different when I went to containers. I was like, I, yeah. I need to like rethink how... Because storage... <laughs> it's, it's so different. The, the beauty of containers is um, you can bring them up and bring them down. Yes. But storage has to be persistent. It needs to be there <laughs> for it, something to it connect to. It took me to. a long time for this very important phrase to really sink in and understand it. I had to work with Docker for probably eight months before I truly understood that containers are immutable. And that was the hardest lesson for me to learn because I had learned from racking traditional hardware and using Linux operating systems, you know, similar to our collective backgrounds. And that was just a hard thing to, to overcome. Yeah, so let's run with that one for a second. And I'm going to tell you my, my favorite thing I love to talk to people about in containers or, or love to expose people to. So on that WordPress example, <clears throat> when you've got a single, single website, that's fine, and you've, you've built your immutable container, and you've got your, your WordPress plugins you want in there, and you've put in, you've uploaded your images, and, and Matt's gone through this with us, with our website. And suddenly now, okay, well, as your load starts to increase, you want to load balance that guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now you need shared storage. How do you do shared storage in containers? So you've got the next level of complexity in there happen, right? So it, it's always sort of growing and expanding, and in some ways it's problems we've had before that have to be mm -hmm. resolved, and some of them are, are new and unique. Um, but yeah, now, to the John, in the, in the WordPress yeah. example, I've looked at WordPress and how you would put that into Docker, and I determined that it was like a major engineering feat that it would have been fun to, I, I still think it would be fun to tackle, but it's not something I wanted to maintain myself. So I went and I, you know, pay a couple hundred dollars a month to WP Engine, and I have very similar functionality yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in doing that, although I, I do think it's interesting because your web server and your app server have to share the same file system, which was yeah. one of the weird things I saw, and then your database has to be, you know, part of that as well. So I, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's interesting, and, and WordPress is sort of a really great 
example for this in several ways. It's one of the, you know, we were talking about the ability to, to spin up a vulnerable application in one click yep. WordPress. There you go. Right. Um, for some of us who have run WordPress, you know, I used to run like web hosting uh, um, services for people. Learning how to harden and secure WordPress, mm -hmm. and so I have like my little checklist, right? But now that I've got my checklist, I can put that into a Docker file, build a secure version of WordPress mm -hmm. that has a lot of those things minimized. So as you start thinking about these things, and you know, I do things manually for a few times while I'm getting the feel for it, and then I'm like, okay, this needs to be automated, right? Mm -hmm. So then, oh hey, Docker file, sort of cool way to do that. Um, but really important, back to what we were saying about, uh, you know, as you go through CS and learn how to code and then bring that into containers, uh, containers sort of force you to do what you should have been doing in the first place in many ways, right, from a market services point of view. And what's really interesting, what I really love telling people about, there's a website out there called 12factor.net, 12factor um, programming. And really what that sort of brings you through is these are the things you should be doing for a microservice, right? So as you were saying before, you want to separate your code and data. Um, you know, you want to have really sort of these things designed in a way and programmed in a way so they can scale easier from the get-go, right? Otherwise, uh, if you're taking a legacy application and trying to bring that into a container, mm -hmm. um, it suddenly becomes uh, a, a lot of whack-a-mole. I think that even just the in doing that, what I learned was uh, it's a more, more secure, in my opinion, than it was originally. In other words, if I take that legacy application... And it's entire, and not just the app, right? But the entire infrastructure that is running on the database, the operating system, the application server, right? And I push that into a container environment. I can really define like exactly what ports are open, what packages need to run. Like I'm limiting my attack surface just by the sheer nature of moving is, is in that long, direction. As long as you're not doing something silly like a putting in a privileged container or some other root access into that environment, yeah. but yes. <laughs> yeah. Or stuffing, you know, everything into one big container right. and giving yeah. everything access to everything. That's what everything. I was going to say. Right. Yeah, it's, it's the, the promise is there, right? Mm -hmm. The promise of, of what you can do with it, um, but it, it, it takes a bit of, um, I'll say, focus and, and determination in some ways mm -hmm. to really make sure you hit that point. Uh, if you go out to like Docker Hub, the sort of the public common place where people go for Docker images public images, you'll find like a Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, RHEL, all these big, fat, crazy, what we're used to, guys who've been doing, you know, virtual machines or, or, or bare metal for the last few decades, you'll find things which look and feel familiar. But if you go and you start taking those and putting those and basing your software on it in containers, you've now got a full OS in each container, mm -hmm. uh, which means you've got the footprint of that full OS, right? And that's what you want to try and get away from. So how do you know what's in that container image? What packages are installed? Are they up to date? Who's um, patching them? Uh, does that need to be installed? So that's a lot of things people need to sort of think about. Um, there, there's different ways you can approach and, and track yeah, that down. Yeah, and I think that's the mistake that I made too, was I thought of a container more as like an OS that was running an application, but it's really just the application. And what me, like, you know, older Linux person, not as much experience as, as, as many out there, right? Like Hal Pomerantz is, is a god in my mind when it comes to Linux and Unix. But I was like, what, what happened to System D? I'm like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gone. I'm, and then I reached like another plane of enlightenment where I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. It doesn't matter because <laughs> it's not an operating system. It's just the application. So you don't need something like System D. Yeah, I mean, best practice for a container is it should be a process, yeah. right? So right. if you if you really drink that and are able to go down that path fully, what do you need to support a single process, right? You know, it, it, that that takes a little more determination and focus to get there. But at that point, you should have a, you know a container image if that's what you're doing, should be a, a few megs, right? And and no bigger. Yeah, but yeah. That, I think that's part of the problem with like Docker Hub and in the different repositories is you have a lot of those underlying uh, system libraries that have a lot of stuff in it that you don't necessarily need. So if you're mm -hmm. using them, there's probably a lot more there than you actually need if you're going to go to a single process dis level, right? You could strip out a whole bunch of stuff because why would you need, you know, a bunch of these other system uh, libraries sitting in there, right? But right. but they're they're there in some of these base images that that sit up in these public repositories. So John, how, how does an enterprise that has fairly complex application. I mean, they're obviously not going to use a community edition. There's other platforms they're going to be pushing their application to. So, like, if you're a security person who's working for an enterprise today and you kind of get the feeling your developers might be moving your enterprise-level applications up into this container world, what are some of the, the tools and techniques and, and gotchas in that arena? It's, 
so what we're seeing and you know from our experience and 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 what we're seeing with customers um it's it's really changing month to month the questions that people are asking the way people are looking at this uh i think if you were to ask that question two years ago, why are people not adopting containers? People would say, oh, we haven't figured out the security story. As people actually got closer to containers, what they really started saying is, we haven't figured out the container story. So mm-hmm. are we going to use Mesos? Are we going to use Kubernetes? Are we going to use Docker Swarm, OpenShift, um, GKE? Uh, we now have Amazon's uh, AKS, I think it is, or, or Microsoft. So which one of these type of things? But so that's what a large portion of the company is trying to figure out that. The security guys, the security architects, um, you now have a blend of thinking in the traditional way you've thought about security for the last few decades uh, with this brand new cool technology. So what so we see people saying, um, a question we, and it's interesting, these waves are really interesting. Um, from April to now this year, we suddenly started getting asked, can you do file integrity monitoring in a container? Mm-hmm. Um, I understand why you'd want to do that. I understand the thought behind it, thought process behind it, but that's really a horrible thing to do in a container. If you have 50 horrible. containers running on a host yeah. and you say, hey, time to scan the file system, uh, God help you. Um, you well, know, and and so not only that, it goes back to my earlier point that containers are immutable. So like the entire scheme could change every hour or, or yeah. more or some, you know, in, in that range. And uh, it, yeah, you're right. That's a terrible idea for security and containers. Yeah, but so it's, really, really, it's, the, the trick there is how do you? Because you know, a lot of things we do in the security industry is is to try and uh, both detect and protect, right? The sort of that balance is what's going on. So how can you how can you provide those type of functionality in a a very quickly changing mm-hmm. uh, you know atmosphere environment? You know, if you've got containers, once you fully drink that Kool Aid and get it to a CI CD process that's able to, uh, you know, push out containers multiple times a day and, and update your stuff that frequency frequently. How do you how do you worry about um, you know your your TLS endpoints? Um, how do you think about uh, firewalling? How do you think about uh, data security at rest or in motion? So there's a lot of things that are they're still there, but it's it's basically not so much look for a point product or not so much look for um, you know. The band-aid for this particular thing, but like I need to, I need to, I need to solve this. I need to secure this, and I need to provide this type of functionality so I can see what's going on inside those containers. How do you do that? So John, that's sort of the way I think about. What's it. the major? So I started with a Docker file, right, and then I moved to Docker Compose. When you make that jump into an orchestrator, wh- what are some of the major benefits, both for the you know infrastructure and, and deployment of your application as well as security? Yeah, um, the security part of that, people. I would say 99% overlook. Um, so in a, in a Docker file, you're defining the what's in that image. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one that you know, there's a thing out there called the. C- you guys are probably familiar with the CIS benchmarks. They've got one now for Docker. One of the core things in there is, don't run whatever's in that container as root. You know, mm-hmm. pick a different user. So that's a really simple one to do in the Docker file side. But on the Docker Compose so- f- side, to so think about that for a second, or you have this the same in um, Kubernetes deployments or Mesos deployments, or again, pick your poison. Um, how can you tighten down the um, privileges of what that container is able to access, what it's able to do, what what's going on with it, um, and and that's sort of really important, right? You don't. There's obviously you don't want things to run with privilege mode or or cap system and like the sort of give that container access to the whole system, but at the same time, if you can minimize that footprint and really sort of narrow down what it's able to do, um, it's the results are you know wonderful and you're hardened. But now we're starting to think a little bit like SE Linux, right? Excuse me, I usually say before I say that word, trigger warning. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, all of us with older experience, the first thing you do with SE Linux is, is turn the thing off. And I'm starting to see that in some platforms out there. Um, I hope that trend doesn't continue. Um, but we're seeing some of that, and we want people to really start thinking about how can you how can you do that and do it in an easy, controllable way. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at deploying into the, uh, the cloud, right, there's yeah. a lot of options. That's kind of where we're going. And I think even your traditional, what is now like a traditional cloud deployment, I, I got like 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 old really fast. I was like, oh, I don't really need to maintain my own infrastructure. Like I can really just go completely serverless and allow the cloud provider to run my containers. What are the pros and cons of, of, of that style of architecture? Yeah, it's, it's flexibility, right? So um, one of my previous lives... I was active in a um, Apache CloudStack. I still am, but if you look at CloudStack versus OpenStack, 
uh, OpenStack, CloudStack, we could get up and running or deploy out in like a you know a few hours on some on your servers, and um, it was good. And there's large telcos using it; it's a great platform. Uh, OpenStack, realistically, probably a team of five to ten people, and come back in about two or three months. But it's going to be exactly what you want, uh, and that's sort of the same thing we're seeing with between say Docker Swarm and, and Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. And then between any of those systems, and if you're going out to a a, a provider who's going to run that for you, um, either containers as a service or you know functions as a service, serverless, whatever you want to call it, uh, and it really comes down to flexibility. So what we're seeing with uh, you know example with uh, Fargate, uh, which is Amazon's uh, containers as a service offering. Uh, there's no storage underneath it right now. So if you want to run a container and have it uh, do something stateful, like say a database, back to that example, um, you can't do it on Fargate right now. So what you'd have to do is you'd run WordPress on Fargate, and then you can have that spin up and down those containers. But if you want to do something stateful, you have to do that in what they call ECS, so um, Elastic Container Service, where you actually have a standard instance and have control over the storage underneath it. So, wait, so, so there's still so some John, things like that to think about. Today, yeah. uh, Fargate does not have a tie into S3 for any kind of storage or tie into RDS to store your database? So RDS, yeah, sure, right? But those are all, it's, it's you're looking at the overall, um, how shall I say, the Amazon ecosystem. So yes. yeah, if, if you want to buy in and, and do all that, yeah. So either S3 or, or RGS and mm-hmm. all those things are there. And I'm sure they're going to have, they're going to solve the stateful thing on the container mm-hmm. side fairly soon. But that's just sort of as the industry is growing. And then as you were saying, based back to um, what are the pluses and minuses, and that's something to think about. People might say, we're going to move everything to Fargate because, you know, we don't want to worry about the the, conta- the um, orchestration system underneath. But, okay, can we actually do that, or, or, or what's the ramifications? Yeah, because if you're not using an Amazon service, then what, right? So you still have to address that right. component of it if you're not using a base Amazon <clears throat> service that's tied into Fargate. You're going to pigeonhole yourself into... Amazon. Yeah, I mean, which for some might be okay. It, right? For some organizations, that's absolutely fine, right? But one of the one of the trends we see is multi cloud support. Well, that means you're not going to want to do too much natively mm-hmm. in all the AWS services because then it potentially limits you of of having a multi cloud strategy. So those are the things you have to think about. Yeah, it becomes a, a oh shoot moment when you are deployed into Amazon and they don't have a feature, but another cloud provider does and you really need that or, or, feature for your application. Or the other way, yeah. right? I mean, we we fought a little bit this at, at Tenable when we mm-hmm. were building out Tenable IO, right? We didn't want to be 100% dependent on AWS because in case we wanted to port it, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're 100% AWS, hallelujah, right? But if you have a multi-cloud strategy, it does create some interesting limitations. Well, we see people doing it in that space sometimes. It's actually, you're not just doing multi-cloud for... Um, how should I say, high availability. So it's not just, you know, we need to be on Amazon and uh, and Google in case one goes down or something happens, we're still up and running. We're seeing people say, hey, we see better GPUs at Google, so we will run um, most of our workloads on Amazon because that's what, you know, our developers are used to or our ops, our ops guys are used to. But then when we actually need something highly network performant or, or CPU, or excuse me, GPU performant, we'll go ahead and make that call out to something at, at, at Google. And the networks are so fast nowadays that that's, um, it's acceptable and people mm. are doing it. That's really interesting. Yeah, so I think the other challenge that we've seen a little bit in the field is, I think we all know, Kubernetes is kind of winning the orchestration game, mm-hmm. but actually managing and building out your own Kubernetes cluster is actually not that easy, right? Mm-hmm. Which is why I think you're going to see more of these kind of trends like ECS, EKS, um, the Azure uh, con- uh, Kubernetes service and GKE, and you've got now services sitting on top of that, like Fargate. Mm-hmm. Um, on the Amazon side, you see Amazon or uh, Azure container instances, which is kind of the equivalent on the Azure side. You know, do you continue to see that momentum of more people saying, I really don't want to manage this stuff. <laughs> and if I don't, great. But, you know, think about the security implications of that when mm-hmm. you don't own the infrastructure anymore because that means you're not installing privileged containers or kernel plugins because you don't own that infrastructure anymore as you kind of move up that stack. Now, if I if I own my own infrastructure today and I have Docker and then I'm looking to move to... Amazon hosting my containers in some capacity or Microsoft hosting my containers in some capacity. What's that transition like? Because it's not really Amazon and Microsoft aren't really running Docker or like what, how do I need to convert my Docker files? Like how do I make that, that, that leap? Is it a lot of work to do that? 
Now, so what's usually, it's what's called a, um, the base, what pretty much everyone using is what's called a OCI compliant image format, right? So mm -hmm. that's what we run Docker builds. That's usually the output, or not usually, that is the output of it. So once you've got that container image, you can run on you know, my laptop, uh, public cloud, private cloud. Uh, we're seeing some people in cars or on, you know, it, the only problem you're usually running into is like, I was going to say Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. um, they're all over this room. But uh, mm -hmm. what you see there is not so much the Docker image format changes, but the architecture, right? So CPU architecture is different. So you yeah. might have to do a recompile of your binaries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that that's what's sort of interesting and light and, and really the way we've done the technology that we have is um, by adding our security into that container image, wherever you run it, um, we're there and we can keep going with it. And that's sort of our thought process behind that. How can we, how can we, and this goes back to what I was saying before, how can you in general look at this really cool new technology and apply security concepts to that. So not so much um, taking the same little firewall or IDS or that type of concept, but how can you do something that gives you the same security but thinking about it in a more modern fashion? But now what you may have to port is your registry service, right? Because if I've got my own Docker registry service, do I have to use Amazon's registry service or Microsoft's registry service? And when I change, probably all my build scripts and automation has to be adjusted as well, right? You don't have to. Um, what we're seeing is, so th that particular part it, in itself, so for folks who don't know, registries where you keep your container images, and, and that is almost a standard across the world. Um, there, there's some little changes here and there, like at, at Amazon's with their ECR, how you do authentication is a little bit different. Sure. Uh, but usually Docker pull, Docker push, that's going to get your stuff moved around okay. in, in, in one environment or another. Um, people usually want... Uh, that registry to be close to where the execution is going to happen, right? Because if you're pulling those images and they're fairly big, you don't want to incur the the network charges, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to be able to do them quickly. But it's 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 a pretty standard puzzle piece nowadays. That's and all. I think, John, I think you know this, but I think right now Fargate was supporting ECR and eventually going to open uh, support other. Uh, repositories and registries, um, but I think Fargate was very tied to ECR initially, initially for full yeah. initially, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and no. I, I, for for our stuff, we have um, well, we've got a few different registries, but like the stuff that we're pulling that we run on on Fargate, uh, we're able to do both a mixture of ECR and pulling from our own private repos. That's awesome. Um, well, what else do security professionals need to know today, uh, in your opinion, John, if their organization is looking or moving towards deploying applications uh, on this container system? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things security professionals need to know to have those conversations and make sure our security is part of the process. So there's there's two things there. Um, one is sort of more about the application running in the container, and then the second is the um, the overall how do you run these things and what's going on. So it's uh, let's tackle that that second one first. If you think about what uh, you know, we're talking about Kubernetes in these different environments. Um, how do you actually run things in there? Do you give developers access to say, go ahead and run 10 copies of this? Do you um, try to put some sort of gatekeeper around that and actually limit or control? Because at the end of the day, these are shared services, right? Um, so how do you make sure that your apps have some level of, um, I'll say, isolation between each other, either just like uh, like what would be called a name, namespace level? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Kubernetes, there's a working group uh, around multi-tenancy. So can you actually do multi-tenancy in the same uh, Kubernetes cluster? Um, it's probably going to take a few more months to figure that one out, but in the short term, you know, you probably want to have multiple Kubernetes clusters. And uh, for those who have set up one, um, I probably just said another trigger phrase. Uh, in the application side itself, you're looking more at um, what's really interesting to me is is what's running in that container, right? So if I'm an ops guy or a security person and someone says, here, run this what is it? You want me to run this thing on your infrastructure, on my infrastructure? Did you build it? Did you verify everything in it? So, you know, there's, there's, that can trigger two different things. There's a concept with Docker of uh, Docker trusted content, which is a signature on the image. Okay, is the image valid? Is the image what we actually built? Has anyone tried to modify it? So that's one step of, you know, let's make sure this is solid and, and has a, a, um, a chain of, of, you know, this came from us. But then the second part is, okay, even still with that, what's in this thing? Is this, do we know the application that's running? Do we know everything that was installed in it? Is there some other libraries in there? So what we've seen people do as they start dipping their toes into that um, uh, enterprise production workloads uh, for containers is they start looking at, you know, A, what's installed in it? Is there any vulnerabilities in there? Uh, what's the program actually doing? What files is it accessing? Um, is it accessing 
something that has a known vulnerability or is it just you know sort of staying over here and doing what it should be doing so that's really sort of um the way we look at it is a how do you how do you know what's going on in there i mean it's the less black boxes you have in your environment as a security person the better right mm -hmm. so what's in there what's it doing how's it doing it and then okay can we actually say that that's all it should be doing and then harden it down and, and again like i was saying before with it Again, sorry, SE Linux. Um, but how can you do that in a repeatable, easy to use fashion and then engage the developers so that they can actually understand what's going on there and um, really sort of uh, execute on the security prescription that you have for um, your applications? What, what are some of the best resources to learn more about this technology, John? Because I, I really struggle with that still to this day. You know, there's. The Docker documentation, there's books, there's blog posts, there's Stack Overflow, and I tend to combine all of those resources together uh, in a very painful process to achieve my goals, but uh, there has to be some better resources out there. Um, you know, it really varies. So it's, it's uh, I've, I've seen you in, in one of your talks in the past, you thought the, the Docker docs were, weren't of the best. I think they're getting better. Um, those guys are uh, uh, really... Um, really growing in leaps and bounds over there in, in some of their things, and documentation is one of them. What I've seen is, you know, uh, I'm pretty fond of some of the subreddits. Uh, it depends on where you're going. If you're if you're looking for a problem, and this is part of the problem with this, right, is if you're looking at something like, okay, where's the problem I'm trying to solve? Is it with storage? Is it with networking? Is it with security? Is it with Docker? Um, so those are all fine and simple. And then, you know, we bring Kubernetes in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're in the wrong place, someone's going to say, well, just look at the source code. And that's when I want to reach out and choke somebody. Um, <laughs> If you're looking at, at Amazon, you know, so all these places, and it's, it's, I don't think I've got a simple, clean answer for you. Um, yeah, it's, uh, to me, a lot of the resources, and the reason I, I pick on the Docker documentation is it's yeah. more, the resources available are a list of ingredients, but they're not the actual recipe that tells me how to cook the meal. <laughs> like, I got to come yeah. up with that on my own. Right, right? you do. Yeah. yeah. And I think probably the, the best thing there to do is um, try not to be on the bleeding edge, right? Because yeah. if you're on the bleeding edge, unfortunately, you're going to have to be looking at source code. And I think that's probably partially why the organizations like enterprises are six to 12 months slower than people were expecting them to adopt. Um, but at the end result of that means you can go out and look at Stack Overflow, or when you Google on an error message, you actually get something useful back from someone else having this pain before. Right. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's uh, probably the, the biggest takeaway there. And this market's going to continue to mature and, and grow. I mean, you know... Kubernetes only won the orchestration game probably a little less than a year ago when, when Docker, you know, announced at DockerCon last year in EU to support it. You know, so that's going to continue to evolve. There's more resources coming out all the time. You know, there there are good places to go for articles and stuff on the higher level problems. But when you dig into some of the technical stuff, yeah, it, it, it's a lot harder to find. It is. It is. But that'll get better because, I, I mean... In my mind, this technology, the benefits far outweigh any challenges that we're <laughs> experiencing today. Like, I think it's well worth the effort uh, to learn this technology and begin using it in your environment. And it's not a magic bullet, right? Because those, those don't exist in our industry. I think there are certain cases where it probably doesn't make sense to move into this space. But the developers are driving the activity here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what security professionals have to understand is the business and the development teams are driving this. This is all part of digital transformation uh, projects to keep companies agile and mm -hmm. in front of their customers and continue to grow revenue. Security has to, they'll have to figure out how to embrace it at some point. They, they cannot sit there and just say, no, 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 because it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. You know, when I did my session at uh, Rocky Mountain ISC uh, of last month, you know, the one question in the audience was, where do I start? I'm like, go to your development teams and ask them, are they developing on containers? Because if they are, you need to sit down with them and start to understand this like right now. And I think mm -hmm. most security professionals, and I think you saw a little bit of this in your session at Source Boston, they don't realize this is actually happening today. And, and they're not in the discussions and they should be in the discussions. And what's interesting is you can see them kind of fall like dominoes and get on board. Like once you get through an, you know, an hour long presentation, they their gears start turning and they're like, I get questions after, which is very encouraging to me. And they're like, so if I've got this project and I want to use it for containers, like, does that work? I'm like, yeah, that's an awesome yeah. use case. And so now I think they're like, oh, they're going to go do it. And then they're gonna, the knowledge and the experience is going to start bleeding into their jobs and their developer is going to use it. And they're like, oh, I understand that now. 
and here's how we think we can apply security, which I think is going to be a moving target for some time. Absolutely. I think it's, it's really interesting, right? So I think the people that are putting time into this now and really embracing it, uh, I think it's going to be time well spent. So yeah. if you know, if you think about it, if you're doing a, a secure software development lifecycle, the quicker you can get, the qu sooner you can get in, involved, the security folks involved in that process, right? You know, uh, even ide ideation or like, well, the architecture is being designed. It's the same thing here. If the security guys can start um, having those conversations with the, the either the developers or the operators as they're starting to think about moving towards containers, um, it gets everyone thinking sooner and, and more comfortable with what's actually happening. And um, the end result, I think, is going to be just huge hugely more beneficial for them. Awesome. Uh, Matt, John, closing closing thoughts, calls to action. You've got a great blog post series that I reference all the time yeah, that we're going to probably do a segment about today and, and release that out. Yeah, we, um, we um, you know, Laird Insights done a lot on the blogging side here with um, just kind of educating the market. Mm -hmm. You know, containers are different and you have to understand they're different. So there's a great number of blog posts out there. I've been working a lot with, uh, with, with your, your folks here at Security Weekly on different aspects of that. Um, Tony Bradley at Techspective, who we used mm -hmm. to work with at Tenable, he's writing on these, this topic. So there are some great resources out there. All that stuff's linked on the, the layeredinsight.com website. Um, so that's a starting point, but you know that, that's one place they can go to start learning a little bit about this. Awesome. Yeah, and additionally to that, you know, we're working also on putting more um, more of this knowledge which we have on the engineering side. We're trying to get some of those blog posts out as well. Um, and you know, it's it's only so many hours in a day, but we've been doing this for for years now. We've got a bunch of really great folks, so we're trying to actually help share that and um, and bring that out to the community. So I'm, you know, for the listeners, if anyone wants to reach out to me, always always happy to talk about this stuff. Um, but we're we're also trying to actually get this out in a published format so people have things to look at. Fantastic. Well, that will conclude this segment uh, and I believe the show. So thanks everyone for watching. Over and out. Take care.